Good morning. Welcome along to a very special NUFC matters. Here with uh, myself, Steve Ray, uh, Milan Cernicek and David Pitcher, who are uh, across in the Czech Republic. Both have got Steve Howie and we've got Dennis Martin. Uh, good morning, guys. Hello. Hello, everybody. Great to have you here. And um, the reason that we are here is because normally each year we have a, a Pavel Cernicek Cup in, uh, in, in honour of the great man. And we always do uh, we always, you know, fundraise for a particular charity. This year we were raising money for a charity which is called Fuzzy Fight Against Tizak, which was set up by a good friend of my Brandon Foster, who left his older brother, uh, Thomas, to the extremely rare Tizak's disease when he was younger. Uh, he dedicated his time to raising awareness for Tazak's uh, disease through his charity and fundraising has broken alongside the Cats Foundation. And his aim is to help families and those affected by the disease by raising viral funds for research into the cure. Uh, Brandon joined the Army Street from school at 16 years of age. He joined the Royal Artillery within eight years and served and completed the Army PT1, which is the physical training instructor course, the All Army Commando course, and the All Army C Company. And he earned parachute wings, having served alongside and supported both Royal Marines and the Parachute Regiment. His aim this year is to win more charity tabs and events to raise help funds. It's obviously been tragedy hit by the COVID. Uh, we were going to donate the Pavel Supercheck uh, game to, to him. So what we're hoping to do with this broadcast today is to raise a bit of money. You can do that by going to newcastlelegends.com and clicking tickets and donating anything from a pound to five pound or to ten pound for this broadcast. So what we're going to be talking about is essentially Pavel Supercheck uh, he's open times at the football club and, you know, getting the stories from those people who best knew him. Um, of course, Milan, Steve and Dennis. What we'll do is we will uh, we will come to Milan first. Um, David, can you ask Milan, um, from his perspective, uh, you know, from his perspective, what was, what was Pablo like as a brother and what was he like as a youngster growing up? On se tě zeptat právě na první otázku, jak je to bylo, když uh, byl Pavel malý a jak vyrůstal. Uh, jak byl malý, tak už jsme se o tom bavili. Je to, je to tak, že uh, od začátku byl v bráně a, a sportoval, dělal další sporty, jako byl nohy, byl tenis. So when, 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 he was, when he was a young boy, uh, he always wanted to be a goalkeeper. Uh, he was very talented uh, on sports because he did athletics uh, and the other the other sports like uh, like uh, football tennis uh, football tennis for instance. So very sportive, very very talented, and always wanted to do the sports. Yeah, great. So did Pavel always want to be a goalkeeper? Teď se ptá, jestli vždycky chtěl být uh, brankářem. No, co já si pamatuju, tak jo. <laughs> What I remember, he always wanted to be a goalkeeper. That's, that's Milan's words. Okay. What were, his, what were his first impressions of Newcastle when he signed for the club? Uh, jaké byly první jeho dojmy uh, z Newcastle? Tak byl to uh, velký klub proti Baníku Ostrava. Bylo to, byl to jeho sen se někam takhle dostat a myslím, že, že si to ani neuvědomoval v té době, kam, kam se dostal vůbec. So, uh, it, was a, it was a big club, uh, Newcastle, in comparison with Bani Gostrava. Uh, so, it was his dream to move somewhere in a, in a big club. And uh, at that time, uh, he personally didn't realize where he is, what a big club he he played for, and uh, it was it was like like a dream come true. And from from your perspective, Milan, how proud of you were were you of, of Pavel um, making the jump from Czech Republic to a team like Newcastle? Uh, pro tebe samotného, jak, jak, jaké, to, jaké to bylo vnímat, uh, že se Bracha posunul právě z Baníku do Newcastle? Jak jsi to vnímal ty? Uh, 
v té době, kdy, kdy tam Pavel šel, tak já jsem měl nějakých 16-17 let a v té době jsem to bral jakoby tak, že se posunul někam, kde, kde jsem si to ani sám neuvědomoval, protože jsem tu soutěž anglickou nějak nesledoval uh-huh. a nevěděl jsem vůbec, kam, kam jde do jako co to je za klub a všechno jsem si to uvědomil, až když už jsem byl potom starší. So at that time, uh, when, when Pavel moved to Newcastle, I was a teenager, 16 or 17, I don't remember the time exactly, but uh, I, only, I only remember that my brother uh, uh, is gone, uh, he moved somewhere, Uh, but I didn't realize that uh, he plays for Newcastle because I didn't, uh, at that time, I wasn't a fan of football, so I didn't, I didn't know where he is exactly. So that, that, that's, these are my thoughts for, for this time. Can you remember any games or did you ever come to Newcastle to watch Pavel play for Newcastle, Milan? Uh, pamatuješ si jeho samotného, jak uh, hrál za Newcastle, že jsi tam za ním někdy jezdil a pamatuješ si něco z té doby? No, uh, vlastně v tom prvním roce, kdy tam Pavel šel, tak jsem tam strávil tři měsíce. The first year when I, when I was there, uh, I remember that I spent three months in Newcastle. A pak jsem šel na vojnu. Then I had to go to the military service in the Czech Republic. No a po vojně už jsem tam potom jakoby jezdil, jak, jak to šlo. No, kdy, kdy... And after the military service, uh, I, I went to Newcastle uh, as much as I could, because it was for me uh, very nice, uh, very nice experience. And uh, in, because uh, at that time it was totally different life in the Czech Republic uh, and, and in England. So... Uh, it was totally different, in, uh, so that's why I wanted to go to there to, to see my brother uh, and Newcastle. Yeah, uh, what was it like um, for you, you know, obviously coming back to Newcastle um, after Pavel passed away and the response that you got from the supporters, that's in the world. Uh, teď se ptá, uh, co pro tebe to vlastně znamená, nebo jak teď vnímáš Newcastle po tom, co nás Pavel opustil, jak vnímáš Newcastle jako takový? Tak uh, Newcastle jsme už sledovali celý život, uh, jakoby od té doby, kdy tam Pavel byl a sledujeme ho pořád, to se nezmění <laughs> nikdy, teda, co bude takhle na pořád a uh, myslím si, že je to velký klub a Uh, teď asi budete mít nového majitele, tak, tak se to ještě asi posune někam jinam. Uh, uh, I, I, I started to support Newcastle when Pavel, when Pavel uh, went there. Uh, since that time I, I, I'm a fan of Newcastle and it will never change. Uh, I will always support Newcastle. Uh, what I know at the moment uh, that uh, Newcastle has a new uh, owner Uh, which means that Newcastle can move uh, to the higher level because the, the new money uh, are there, is there. So uh, I will always uh, support Newcastle and it will never change. Great stuff, Davis. For now, thanks. Um, if we get any questions, we will bring you back in. I'm now going to uh, bring in um, Steve Howie and uh, hopefully speak to Steve about uh, his memory of, of Pavel Kvinacek. You have to bear with us because I haven't muted mics before, Steve. Hopefully I've got you back on. Um, Steve, what's your earliest memory of Pavel Kvinacek at Newcastle United? Well, first, first of all, when you've seen him, you know, he, he just had a huge presence about him. You know, he was a, a big lad. Um, obviously in the dressing room initially, You can, you know, lads getting stripped off and there's always different shapes and sizes and physiques and all that kind of thing. Uh, Pav got stripped off for me and he was absolutely ripped. I mean, ripped. Right? And everybody was looking at him thinking, wow. I mean, it was just like the perfect body. Not that, you know, we were looking at him kind of in that way, but it was just, a, he was just a pure athlete. Um, and then obviously you're seeing him on the training pitch 
and his, 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 last, his athleticism was absolutely ridiculous. I mean, shots that, you know, you could see that the boys or yourself were, were hitting, and they're, they're in the top corner. And you think, and he's not getting that. Or goalkeeper's not getting that. And he would spring so far. He was so athletic, as I said, so athletic. He would spring so far across either side and tip it over. And you'd be thinking, wow. Um, then came, um, I think there was a text come through as well about... Um, his antics when he got the ball at his feet. Now, we used to just sort of say, look, pal, you know, if you get at your feet, either play it or, or, or kick it. But he loved to dribble. He loved to sort of, you know, he had that um, eccentricity about him, really, that the kind of, the flair of, of him wanting to sort of kind of show people how good he was on the ball. Because he, he, wasn't, he wasn't bad on the ball, to be quite honest. I mean, in head tennis, he could get his leg right up and, and hit it over the net where nobody else could. Certainly nobody had that flexibility. But he kind of reminded people of, um, I think it's, is it Hagita, who was the Colombian goalkeeper who used to come running out? Um, didn't take as many risks as Hagita, to be quite honest. But um, look, I mean, I, I know that Newcastle fans used to kind of like heart in the mouth when he used to come out with the ball. But in all fairness, I can't really think of any time when he, he'd lost it or, or cost us a goal by doing that. Um, I used to say to him a lot of times, you know, as a goalkeeper, and that, this was the Shea, this was the Shaka, this was any goalkeeper that I played with. Look, if you've got to come and you've got to wipe me out just to get the ball, then then do it. You know, I'd rather that than them kind of be a little bit hesitant. Um, I mean, look, I think w with, with Pavel, like any goalkeeper, you know, they will make mistakes. But the amount of times he saved us was absolutely ridiculous because, again, on the field, if the striker's got the ball and he hits a shot or a midfield player or the winger it hits a shot, when it goes past you and you turn to look, a lot of times you're thinking, well, goalkeeper should get that. Or you're thinking, goalkeeper's got no chance. And then with Pavin goal, it, 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 it pulls something out, which you just think, I don't know how he's actually managed to save that. Um, but on top of that is the fact of, you know, he was a very, very good goalkeeper. He was an unbelievable lad. You know, he kind of struggled a little bit with the language initially, but obviously did did his homework and, and you know, tried his, his utmost best to, to learn the language a lot better. Um, I think his English wasn't English. It was kind of Geordie, sort of <laughs> a, like a, a Geordie Czech. So it had that kind of funny twang about it um, and like little things that he used to, used to shout. I mean, obviously I could hear him in my ear all the time when he's shouting. Um, but as I said... An unbelievable, unbelievable lad. And, and, and for me, you know, in, in your lifetime, sometimes you meet people that make a major impression on you. And some people, you know, you kind of, you know them and, you know, the, the, you get on really well and, and stuff like that. But there's not very many that actually leave an impression of you, of them on, on yourself. And, and certainly Pavel was one of them. Pavel obviously, you know, made an impression with the supporters as well. And I think we all remember in, you know, you know that promotion season when Newcastle, you know, demolished Leicester at home 6-0 six, six in the first half and 7-1 final score. And, and Lee Clark's brother had managed to uh, knock up a T-shirt with Pavel as a Geordie on and, and Lee gave him the T-shirt, didn't he? And that, that, you know, that must have meant a lot to Pavel. Absolutely. I mean, I think he, he, he realised that, that you know, because of who he was and how he went about things and the performances that he did, and the, like I said, the, the kind of eccentricity at times of him. You know, as I said, sometimes he would be absolutely amazing. And then like all goalkeepers, they have a little, they, they could make a rick. The game in point, which was the Leicester game, he comes for a cross, drops it and score. But the fans absolutely adored him. And I don't think he, I think he, he knew the fans liked him, but I didn't think he realised how much they loved him, not liked him, loved him. Towards the end, he got that. Um, because obviously everybody sings Pavel is a Geordie and the T-shirts were worn, worn and there was all, all the stuff that was, um, that fans had, had, had kind of done. And he was basically a cult hero amongst the fans and, and, and still is and rightly so. Uh, when, when he was at the club, Kevin Keegan, you know, always seemed to be, I wouldn't say unhappy. He just he was always pushing for pushing for bigger things with with the club. We saw that with Andy Cole. He let Andy Cole go, and the fans were up in arms. He came onto the steps and defended his decision. And then you know 
what happened was we brought Les Ferdinand and ultimately Alan Shearer in. It proved to be the right thing. But with Pavel, I think most fans probably felt Pavel got a bit of a raw deal because he brought in Shaka Hislop and, you know, it seemed as if he was trying to push him out. He always seemed to be bringing in another goalkeeper and didn't seem to be keen. Was that the impression the players got? I mean, it was certainly what impression the fans got, Steve. Well, I think, you know, when, you, when you're striving to be better and better, I think the manager, especially Keegan, and, and I suppose even now, now when, when you play, I think it's, it's, it's important that you have quality in your position. So it makes you up your game. And, of, of course, with likes of Shea Given, who was a fantastic goalkeeper, Shaka, who was a fantastic goalkeeper, Path, fantastic goalkeeper, it was really up to them, given the opportunity to, to grasp it. And if you played well, then fine. But because the quality was there... You know, unfortunately for goalkeeper, if you make a mistake, it normally costs you a goal. That could mean dropping points or losing the game. Uh, and unfortunately for goalkeepers, if that did happen, because we had likes of Shear and Shaka uh, there, um, you know, they'd find themselves out the next game, which I always thought thought was a bit harsh because forwards miss chances, midfield players give the ball away, defenders lose the man, and ultimately, you know, sometimes, a lot of times, they, you know, they'd still keep the players. I'd still keep my players. And I think it was a little bit harsh on on the, the goalkeepers, to be quite honest, because I think it actually made them a little bit more nervous because they, they knew that the slightest little mistake and that could cost them their position. Um, but, I mean, as as I said, we all had faith in Pav. We all had faith in, in Shaka and Shea. But it, it is kind of disrupting for a defence when the goalkeeper's getting changed every now and again. I mean, you know them, you know the game, they know yours. But it's still not the same when you have a one which is going to be there and you know he's going to be there. If he makes a rick, he makes a rick. He's going to be there next week. Look, if they make five or six on the belt, then fair enough. Uh, but um, I always thought it was a bit harsh on the goalkeepers because it was a real pressure cooker for them. It wasn't not just the pressure of actually playing for Newcastle and trying to perform to the levels that was expected. Uh, but obviously, knowing that if they make a rick, then they could, they could be out the team. Um, so I, I thought that was harsh on the goalkeepers, but at the same time, I think if you if you're a team which is wanting to progress, I think you've got to have uh, good players in your position to push you on and to learn from. To be quite honest, is there a particular game or a particular save that stands out for you, Steve, that Pavel was involved in or pulled off? To be quite honest, Steve, I think there was there was too many. There's too many times when it was either down to his right or down to his left. Um, or up in, the, up in top bins and you're just thinking like even in training you're just thinking how, how the bloody hell have you reached that it's just because normally it's gone it's, it's in you know sometimes you just think goalkeeper you're wasting your time even making the effort because it's, it's in and you just see him pull it out and you think that, 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 I mean that is just ridiculous and there's too many times I've actually saw that and just thought that, I mean that is frightening as, a, as somebody that didn't score a lot of goals you know when you've hit it and you know it's going to go in. And there's been plenty of times when I've seen forwards and opposition players of the, of the team the team that we're playing against more or less turning away in celebration because they know it's in the back of the net and Pav would pull, pull something out from nowhere. Yeah, great stuff and, and, and great memories. Um, Dennis, are you, are you OK to, uh, to speak? I don't, I don't know what he's doing with his, with his uh, tablet, by the way. He's I'm making me a bit, making me feel a bit sick. I'm starting to lose my battery. Hang on. Okay, Dennis, we'll let you get your technical stuff sorted. Um, once you're back, on, we'll come back to you. Um, Steve, I just want to talk to you a little bit about the takeover because people watching this will, of course, you know, want to want to know if there's anything going on. There's certainly been a lot of developments over the course of the last week, and 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 it seems that the media, especially, are are saying now we're looking more towards days rather than weeks. And there seems to be a lot of positivity around it, Steve. Yeah, I mean, I can't remember who the reporter was. Uh, was on Talk Sport, I think it was, just the other day, sort of saying it is a case of days rather than weeks. And let's hope it is. I mean, we've been doing these podcasts now for a, for a good few weeks, a couple of months, whilst, whilst we've had this lockdown. And uh, again, it's it's kind of been a little bit. Well, it has been very frustrating that it's just keep keep going on and going on and going on. And now it seems as though it seems to be a lot clearer. Um, and the the kind of thoughts that you're getting and the feelings that you're getting is it, it is certainly a lot closer than 
than um, we were possibly thinking and then a week ago because we kind of weren't hearing anything. Now it seems as though it seems to be getting a little bit quicker um, and we could hopefully hear something um, this week. But you know and I know, I'm not putting a date on it. That's absolutely pointless. Um, you know and I know I'm not going to say, uh, I, well, there's a source. Um, yeah. The only source I'm going to mention is either HP or Tomorrow. <laughs> Brilliant. Obviously, we played the first game, and I've got to be—I've got to be perfectly honest, mate. I was really impressed. Um, you know, Newcastle's you know had a, a big break, as has everybody else, and they, they bounced back in in style. And you know, regardless of the man being sent off, I thought even in the first half, Newcastle played well. It was—it was a good performance by Bruce's, Bruce's boys. It was. I mean, listen, there'll be a lot of people that's listening to this, and a lot of kind of anti anti Steve Bruce. I thought his team were ready. They were up for it. They were organised. Um, you know, there was the, the Joel Linton chance early early doors. You know, it was a really good a link up play by the three forwards, which is Maximan, uh, Almiron, and, and Joel Linton. But you, I mean, Joel Linton, when he has his chance, you think, oh, wow, you know, um, he just completely scuffed it. But I thought, uh, I mean, I thought Isaac Hayden, first of all, was, was excellent. Yeah. Uh, but I thought all lads played really well. Um, and they're a difficult team, them, Sheffield United. Make no mistake about it. They're not where they are uh, through pure luck. They're very well organised, got a very good manager. And I thought this would be a tough game. But Sheffield United were, were unfortunate not to win it uh, and should have won it, Aston Villa. Um, but, I mean, the sending off, I thought Joel Linton did well off, well for that. You know, he uses his, his presence, his physical ability. He kind of bullies the centre-half, who then has to pull him back and get him sent off. So he's done well there. And then he gets his goal. I mean, I'm just hoping that that gives him some confidence and he can push on from there. But I thought starting back, you know, I mean, uh, you know, to get a win was brilliant. I mean, it's just sod's law, though, that, you know, they get packed houses week in, week out. And then the last, what, three games, they don't score at home. And then there's no fans there and they get three. Um, so that's just because Newcastle. I've got to be honest, Steve, there was times in that game where I thought, you know, half time is in particular, nil-nil, Newcastle not scoring goals. And, you know, had the fans been there, you've been there many times like I have, um, you know, there would have been moans, there would have been groans, there would have been, you know, there would have been, you know, a lot of mumbling. There would have been a few hundred people probably in the 52,000 crowd booing, which, you know, has become a, a hobby of some people. Um, you know, for me, I feel that, you know, it worked in Newcastle's favour. I'm not saying don't have fans at the games in future, but I just felt... On that, you know, on that particular occasion, it did, and 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 of course, you know, you yourself, you played the, you know, best part, best part of your football career. It can also work in your favour when, and the decision goes against you, and the crowd being quiet, the crowd get the crowd get motivated and start cheering and shouting. There was a couple of occasions where I thought, oh, we could have done with the crowd there, but it, it was weird, wasn't it? And of course, you've been to a game as well as a referee assessor, and, and you know, you've experienced it yourself. Yeah, I mean, it is it is kind of weird. To be fair, I mean, I, I did Man City and Arsenal and you can hear the players and, and all that kind of thing. And it, it, it's not the same, as I said before. Football for me is is the fans, pure and simple. Um, and, and, and it's a shame that they're not allowed in at this particular moment. I can kind of agree with what you're saying because I understand that fans do get frustrated and fans rightly so, not just Newcastle, fans across the world. And, and certainly in the Premier League, they make a feeling sure. Some players can react to it and, and the, the feed off it and some players don't. I just think possibly this was a good time for Jolington because he missed his chance. And you can imagine there would have been, not just after his chance because he'd missed it, the, the odd shout, which you will get, you know, and, and that's the fans' prerogative. They can do that. They paid the money to do that. And that might have kind of put him in his shell a little bit. But he didn't have that. And therefore, he kind of thought, well, you know, if I lose, I think maybe his thinking was, if I lose the ball, it doesn't really matter. It matters, but I'm not going to, there's not going to be that, background noise where you can hear it. And you can hear it as a player. You can hear insults and, and different stuff getting thrown at you. You can hear the good stuff as well. Uh, but obviously, it, it didn't affect him. Now, hopefully, in these games, he can get his confidence up. And when the fans come back, you know, he can show them properly and they can appreciate them as well, which they really want to do. They want to support them. They want to appreciate them. But obviously, he's got to show them a little bit more. Great stuff, Steve. Dennis, you seem to be settled now, mate. So we will. I am, yeah. I'm plugged in. 
Dennis, obviously great to have you on, and, and people won't know really who, who you are and what you were to Pavel. So can you just explain, you know, how you met Pavel Turnacek? Well, I met him, um, he actually met a friend of mine on holiday in Greece, and um, they exchanged telephone numbers, and he came to this friend's house who just lived around the corner from me, and we were invited around, and, and, and we met Pavel, you know, and uh, we all got on very well. And true to form, you know, Pavel, if he says he'll do something, he always did, as, as all of us know. And he got in contact with us again and said, look, uh, if you want to, do you fancy meeting up in Newcastle and going out for a Chinese, which we did. Uh, Chinese being, his, as Milan knows, was his, one of his favourite foods. And we went to a new rendezvous, actually, which Steve might know, up in Darris Hall, uh, Kevin, Kevin Lou's restaurant. And uh, we had a great meal with all of our families. And really, I think that's what kicked it off. You know, we all got on so well and we kept in touch regularly. And as a result of that, Pavel became a friend for over 22 years. Uh, he, he'd only been with me. I'm a Sunderland supporter, actually, so... When I met him, it was a bit strange, you know, getting to know someone who was coming to see. And my friend also is a Sunderland supporter. But really, that didn't bother Pavel. You know, he, he, he really, he wasn't that type of guy. You know, he, he took people at face value. And uh, he made it very clear, hey, look, that doesn't bother me. You know, good luck to Sunderland. Um, but, you know, I play for Newcastle. And, you know, what does it matter? You know, we're friends. We like each other. And that's the way it was. He liked, but, China. he liked Chinese, Dennis. What else did he like about, you know, the, the Northeast culture and, and Newcastle in particular? Oh, I think, I think the big thing was the, um, he loved the football. I think he loved the life in the Northeast. I think he found it quite similar to his background, you know, that it, it wasn't a big city. People were very friendly. Um, it was, Although he liked Newcastle, he loved Newcastle City Centre. He loved uh, Phoenix and John Lewis were his favourite stores. When you used to go into Phoenix with Pavel, half the staff used to sort of know him, you know, because he used to frequent the place quite regularly. You know, he used to love looking at the bedding. He loved, he loved nice things, Pavel. You know, and he had a, uh, he's a bit of a, he was very much a perfectionist, and he he had a good eye for. For everything for the home you know and his clothes and things like that the toiletries even his ralph Lauren underwear you know he, he was very particular in he knew exactly where it was in phoenix and whenever he was here he would always go there and buy a selection of underwear or his different creams that he liked um he was a, a, a creature of habit and and he loved a lot of what newcastle city center was all about and of course, behind all that, uh, he had tremendous admiration for Newcastle Football Club. I think playing for such a uh, successful big football club, which was known around the world, I think he was very proud of that, you know. And, uh, and you know, the fans, he, he knew he had a, a relationship with the fans uh, and, he, and he adored that. Yeah, there's no question. Um, I think in many ways, he never lost that really. Even after he left Newcastle, whenever I used to speak to him on Skype, he always wanted to know what's happening up there, what's happening in Newcastle, what's the latest. And I, I used to keep him up to date with everything because, you know, he used to do the Chronicle on a Saturday. Um, I used to send everything over to him and he used to sit and read it all. So he was up to date when he used to speak to Mark Douglas. Um, I know Mark Douglas commented he was amazed how knowledgeable he was. I think a lot of that was all the stuff I used to bang over to him, you know, to keep up to date with what was happening. Um, but he, he never, he never ever lost his love for Newcastle. He always, I think, in his mind, hoped that one day he could get back there, which of course he did. Uh, unfortunately, it was only for half a season. I think he, he would have loved to have probably got an extra year, but unfortunately, at the time when Sam Allardyce was there, uh, it was not going to happen. Um, but that's life, you know. And I think behind all of that, 
he would have it would have been an absolute dream come true if he could have got back there perhaps as the goalkeeper coach i think deep down in his heart it was something he would have loved to have uh, aspired to uh, in the hope that he could help newcastle maybe get back to the way they were in the 90s which maybe could well happen now if this big takeover from the saudis come on and they put a lot of money in then i think Pavel, you know, will be looking down. He'll, he'll be as happy as, as every single Newcastle fan if that was to happen. And he was immensely fit, wasn't he? Steve's mentioned it. You know, he, you know what? You know, he mentioned what he was like just the first day that he was in the dressing room. The lads would always look at him, and he was like, he was very cut. I mean, it was, you know, it was, he was just he lived his life in a very healthy way, didn't he? Oh, very much so. Yeah, I mean, he's uh, he used to. He was very careful in what he ate, what he drank. He never touched alcohol. Uh, only in the days when he went to Italy and he started to learn about red wine. <laughs> and often you would go to his hotel or when we were out there uh, at his house, he, he would get a nice bottle of red wine out. Uh, it was always a very good one because he had books and he used to read about it and he studied it. It became a bit of a, a bit of an, a big interest. I think he learned that when he was in Italy. Um, but Typical Pavel, he would open a bottle. I remember when he, he was down playing in London and we would, when he was at Portsmouth, we were down there, we went to his hotel and he had a bottle of wine and he said, oh, would you like a glass of wine? And he had this bottle and it was half, half empty. I said, oh, I said, have you already drank half a bottle, Pavel? He says, no, 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 no. He says, I opened this three nights ago. <laughs> he says, I only have one little glass each night. <laughs> He, he was so disciplined, you know, and that's why I think he looked so, so good right up to the week before we lost him. You know, um, when he was here, as you know, Steve, with his book, I mean, honestly, he was fit as hell. You know, he was, his body, when he grabbed hold of you, it was like an iron bar. <laughs> you know, he, he was still lean and and you know full of uh, strength and that's why it's just hard to believe he's not here you know yeah i mean it, it's tragic really when uh, and you see that you know the, you know comments coming in on the screen there Pablo will be my number one wonderful man and a true good legend Peter robson it was it was tragic and um you know we were all shocked obviously yourself dennis steve me we traveled over to the Czech Republic with Steve Harper and Natalie Hubbard and Lorenzo and Tom to to attend the funeral and uh, pay our respects and uh, yeah, yeah. It, it is still still very raw I think for for all of us we none of us can believe none of us can believe that he's he's not here anymore. I don't think it'll ever sink in, Steve. To be honest with you, and I think anybody who got close to Pavel, which I think all of us did. I know Steve, as a player, was close to him, being a defender right behind him. And, you know, a lot of association between central defenders and goalkeepers, I, I would believe. And when you got close and really knew what Pavel was about, I mean, he was unique. You know, he, was, he just had something. Um, he wasn't, a, he was quite a quiet person, Pavel, but he had so much presence and character and and genuineness about him, you know, he was so humble, um, but he was very, very good at whatever he did, you know, whatever he did, whatever he put his hand to, he, he, he was, he would go out of his way to do it perfect and do it just right, you know, uh, we used to laugh when he used to stay with us, he would take him one and a half hours to, I don't know whether Steve ever saw this when they used to go on, on tour, but it would take Pavel one and a half hours to pack his suitcase. You know, he used to have it absolutely perfect. You know, he would take it out three times and put it back in again. So everything was, he could fit every little corner and get it perfect. And that was Pavel, you know. And Milan can probably recall uh, the, way, the way he was. You know, everything in his house. If you opened his wardrobe doors, you might remember when we went to his house at the funeral. You know, he opened his wardrobe doors and everything was perfectly stacked up. You know, that was Pavel. He was a, a total, unique uh, perfectionist, you know, in everything. Um, he's such a, a great, great person. And 
it's very hard not to miss someone like that who you got close to. Dennis, I know you spoke to him on, on, on many occasions about many things, but what was his feelings about you know the you know the way that Kevin Keegan had treated him at, at the club? Did he feel as if he was you know almost trying to push him out? Um, no, I don't. I think Pavel had a lot of respect for Kevin Keegan. I think um, what I think probably the thing that used to hurt Pavel a little bit with Kevin Keegan, if the if you if you really he never really went over the top about it, stuff like that. Pavel never criticised people. It wasn't in his nature, you know. He, he, but sometimes if I got close to him and I used to prompt him and ask questions, I think the thing that Pavel always, for a lot of his career, he really never had a godfather, you know. Someone who said, you are my man, you know, and... I think he knew Kevin. I think he respected Kevin Keegan. He, he certainly thought he had a lot of attributes. The way he managed the football club and the way he gave the guys freedom to to play their football, which I think that was Kevin Keegan's style. He was very much on the front foot, which is what probably created the the entertainment in the nineties, which Steve was a big part of. I mean, everybody loved to watch Newcastle. Um, I loved to watch them because Pavel was there, but I actually also enjoyed them because they were so exciting to watch and the way they played their football. And, you know, the, the old story of, you know, they score three, we score four. I mean, that was there for everybody to see. Um, and I think Pavel quite enjoyed that. And, and he loved to play football that way because Pavel, I guess, was ahead of his time, really. He, he was probably one of the original alongside probably Peter Schmeichel being one, a, a, a sweeper keeper, you know, which everybody heroes today. They talk about uh, Edmund at Ed, Edison at uh, Manchester City. He's very much like that, you know, very extrovert. Um, Pavel actually was doing that 20 odd years ago, you know, and he used to, Pavel used to get lambasted for it. You know, I remember sitting watching Match of the Day and, you know, people like Hansen saying, what the hell is he doing, you know? <laughs> You know, people used to make comments like, no, the wonder Kevin Keegan's got grey hair with a keeper like that, which really was a bit out of order, to be honest with you. But I think it was so unorthodox and not many keepers did that. But Pavel was brilliant at it, you know. Um, he often used to say he, he loved coming out to take a man on. And he, used, he said it didn't worry him because he had the confidence with his feet. And he used to also deliberately do it because he knew that, crowd loved it and <laughs> he wanted to entertain them in some ways which you know I used to say to him yeah but Paul you know do you not think sometimes that if you're caught it up then you know safety first really you don't want to end up giving a goal away he used to say then I don't cock it up <laughs> you know <laughs> you know <laughs> and he had confidence doing it you know but I mean I watch and I'm sure all of us do if you put YouTube on watch some of the the clips of Pavel playing, you really, there's a couple of them. I think I sent one to you, Pavel, uh, Steve, a, few, a, a week or two ago. Uh, when you watch Pavel, you know, the way he played, you know, coming out, heading the ball, racing off the line, getting the ball, dribbling past two people, lashing it up the field. And also he's throwing, you know, he could throw with both arms. He could kick with both feet. Um he used to get accused of not coming off his line. My God, when you look at some of the old footage, Pavel actually came off his line more than most keepers. Um, you know, he'd be over the top of people punching balls out that really you would you would think, Christ, what's the goalkeeper doing that? But in the majority of cases, he would connect with it. And I think really Pavel was, uh, was, was ahead of time um, in the days of of the 90s and even when he went to to Italy um you know he, he played really well for Brescia and which resulted in him getting about 40 caps for Czech Republic so he was it's a real shame because he was about 29 30 when he left Newcastle and when he went to Brescia he had three fantastic years there um I just think it's such a shame that those years couldn't have been played at Newcastle because Goalkeepers get better with age, I think, Steve, don't they? 
Yeah. Uh, Steve Howie, I'm asking on that one. I think he would probably say that. Go on, Steve. Know, well, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's just like, I, I think players as well, you know, outfield players, you get better with experience. Yeah. Um, as I said, Parv was one of these goalkeepers where you see somebody like um, Kasper Schmeichel, the way he comes out and blocks it like his dad used to. Yeah. And everybody used to rave about Peter Schmeichel because he did that. Pav used to do it. Pav, used, Pav was very, very good at it as well. You know, he used to make himself look big. It was difficult to spread his legs, spread his arms. Because he was that, that athletic, he, he could more or less do the splits. Yeah. And oh, well, he can't, he could do the splits, which it was painful to look at, but he still did it. Um, and, and put his arms up, and he, and he would save a lot more than what actually went through him. Absolutely, but it's, it's, it's always the same. Sometimes I think you know, whilst he was appreciated massively by the fans, I think, um, as I say, because of the 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 Shaka being there and and Shear and stuff like that, sometimes you have to move to feel appreciated by a manager. Because it's the manager that's bringing you in, um, and I think obviously Pav when he went when he went to Brescia, um, he had a manager that trusted him. That was more or less sort of saying of him, "You're my number one," and it just goes to show because of the performances that he did for three years there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 100%. yeah. yeah one more thing, Dennis. Um, just want to just a minute mention Lorenzo really um, in his restaurant Sapori's, uh, which which is no longer. No longer there under under his management, but probably just a little spending a bit of time up there, didn't he? Just, just with you know with his family or just with you and friends, just uh, you know just having a nice meal and a you know a nice chat. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, when Pavel came here, at least twice a year um, after he left Newcastle, um, after his three years in in Italy, because obviously he couldn't come backwards and forwards from Italy, but after that for about the last six, seven years of his life. He was here at least twice every year. As you know, Steve, we used to meet up with you quite a lot. And um, we always, he would always go to Lorenzo's. He met Lorenzo 20 odd years ago as well. He used to, he used to work in a restaurant in Jesmond, uh, an Italian where Pavel used to go and that's where he met him. And as, as everyone knows, Lorenzo's always, all his life been a fanatic on football. So he had something very big in common with Pavel. And whenever they were together, they would talk football all the time. You know, football, Italy, anywhere in the world, talk about players, talk about styles, talk about the technical aspects of it. Um, so, yeah, you know, with, with um, Lorenzo having the, the restaurant in Jesmond, um, when he was here, we would be there nearly every day. <laughs> and... Lorenzo's food was was first class, and Pavel used to love love going there and uh, and eating his pasta and and everything else, you know, uh, for sure. You used to get across um, to meet him as well, didn't you? You would you would. Sorry, I missed that, Steve. I'm saying you would travel abroad as well to see him. You, Tom, Lorenzo, you would have an answer to way to see him. Definitely, yeah, uh, yeah. We used to go to we used to go to Prague uh, every year um, when Pavel was co goalkeeper coach, and uh, we used to stay. Uh, Pavel used to put us into a hotel. Uh, a couple of times we were in the same hotel as where the players used to stay when there was uh, a match on, and uh, we used to we used to have some great fun. Uh, there's one occasion which is a good story. Um, we were we went out for the day. Uh, Tom uh, from from Barber, who's also very very close to Pavel, and and was again for about twenty odd years. That's how uh, Tom Lorenzo and myself became so friendly because the three of us were very close to Pavel. So us three are still very close to this day. Um, but the three of us used to go to Prague every year, and there was one day we. We went out on a trip and we jumped on this bus and we ended up, God knows where, we ended up on a tram and we were miles away from um, Prague. And we thought, shit, we're supposed to be back uh, to meet uh, uh, Pavel's girlfriend, actually, Leduska. She was picking us up to take us to this football match. So we jumped on this tube and we got lost and we were going in the wrong direction. So we jumped off this tube. 
we ran across the line <laughs> onto the other side, hoping we'd be able to find a tram which would go the other way, which thank God it did. Anyway, we raced into this hotel. Um, it was quite late, and Pavel had put us on the VIP floor, and we had free access to this bar and everything. So Tom Lorenzo was saying, oh, my God, we wanted to have free champagne tonight uh, before the match. And we said, hey, I don't think we've got time now. Anyway, Lorenzo said, oh, bollocks to that. Let's go straight into the lounge and have a drink uh, because we've got a few minutes. So we went into this lounge, Tom B, and, and there was nobody in. Lorenzo goes, opens the champagne, pours the champagne out. The three of us are drinking this champagne. Lorenzo's telephone rings. Pavel, where the fuck are you? <laughs> so, we, <laughs> Lorenzo says, oh, we're just having a glass of champagne in this VIP lounge. He said, what? He says, get down here now. <laughs> we're on the coach. He's supposed to be in the car, <laughs> in his car, which Ladusco was driving, following the coach. And suddenly, we jumped up like three naughty schoolboys. We ran downstairs so fast. We ran out. Papa was standing there. He nearly killed us. <laughs> he was such a man for, you know, everything had to be spot on. And, and we were quite embarrassed, really. You know, he, he never he never let us off the hook. If ever we used to make a joke about it, he used to say, that wasn't funny. <laughs> <laughs> Milan, I'm going to go back to, to you now. Uh, we've got breaking news. Not very often we get breaking news on this programme, Steve, but uh, Jonathan Woodgate has been sacked as Middlesbrough manager and Neil Warnock is now uh, is now taken over as manager at Middlesbrough. What do you make of that, Steve, before I go to Milan? Yeah, I'd, <clears throat> I'd heard about this about uh, quarter 11, 11 o'clock. <clears throat> um, so I'm, I'm good at for Woody. Um, you know, it's always difficult for a, for a young manager to make his mark. Um, I think there was, you know, the, the team were struggling. He had to use a lot of kids, even though uh, Millersburg's got a very good academy, uh, got some good coaches there. Um, but uh, I mean, Steve Gibson's not a one to, to get rid of managers and stuff like that, but obviously losing 3 0 at home uh, at the weekend, uh, the fourth uh, from bottom, and I think level on points with the team that's just below them. Um, but Warnock. Neil Warnock, you can't get shot of him, can you? He's always about. And he'll get he'll get them out of it. I've got no doubt about he will. that. There's a That's very good chance, you know. He's he's good at that. To be quite honest, I worked a little bit under him when I um before I went to the US. I went and, and trained with uh, Sheffield United, and um, love him or hate him, he does tend to get the job done. He does 100. percent Milan, we're going to come to you and um, just want to ask you this the question we've had in from uh, Peter Robson. Um, he says, if the takeover happens this week at Newcastle United, um, what cans will you drink to celebrate? Now, in Newcastle, Milan, um, we've got a hashtag on social media, hashtag cans. We want to know what alcohol you'll drink, and I'll be interested to hear it'll what be you that, it'll, it'll be that. It'll be that ridiculous one. I can't even see it, and there's a reason I can't. It's ruined us. Já si myslím, že kdyby si byl teď na tom, na tom kdyby se odehrál nějaký zápas a Newcastle by vyhrál, jaký alkohol uh, by, by spil? Řekni mu, že nepiju alkohol. Uh, Milan doesn't drink alcohol. That's a lie. When we were across there, he had us on Slipovic. Říkáš, že když, když tam byl, takže si byl Slivovici. Slivovici, jo, jo, ok. Slipovic. Do you know what? They put that in the pockets, you know, when they go to the moon. From time to time, I do the exceptions, and if I drink something, it's Slivovice because uh, it's national national uh, alcohol drink. National rocket fuel, that's what it yeah. is. National 100%. rocket fuel. 100%. Just want to ask Milan what you know, how the family are doing. Obviously, we, we came across there, you know, to see you all at that terrible time. You know, how has the family coped uh, over the last few years? I mean, you know, we, we all keep in touch. We get photographs from you. You know, how 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 is the family doing? Uh, teď se tam někdo ptá, protože to je jakoby, uh, tam se ptají různě lidi a ptá se někdo, jak se daří, tvůj, uh, jak se daří Pavlové rodině a jak v podstatě zvládají uh, nebo zvládá ta rodina tu situaci od doby, co, co se stala ta tragedie. 
No, úplně, úplně to nevím, protože jsme s Pavlovou rodinou se nějak nestýkáme. A on se, on se ptá i na jakoby, tvoji jo, rodinu. Jo, jo. Tak to, tak. to řekni, že je doma všechno, OK. A, mm-hmm. a, OK, so uh, uh, from, from Pavel's side, uh, I mean his wife, daughter and son, I don't know because uh, I'm not in contact with them. And regarding uh, mom uh, and sisters, everybody's okay, are healthy and trying to trying to uh, handle with the situation. Good. I, I, I mean, you know, from, from your perspective, do, are you doing anything out there, David? Are you, you know, do you, obviously you still remember Pavel, you know, you send us photographs of that, but are you doing anything to remember Pavel's name? Is there anything being said in, in, in the Czech Republic? Uh, sorry, mis- uh, I misunderstood because uh, I didn't, I didn't hear everything for, of your sentence. Have you set anything up uh, across in Pavel's hometown or in the Czech Republic to remember Pavel? Do we have the Pavel Cup, you know, football game over here. Do you do anything over there? Me personally, or pa- or Milan? Both of you, uh, or anybody? Ah, ta se v podstatě jestli ta jestli. Je někdo, kdo, koho si vlastně pamatujeme uh, z dob, kdy Pavel vlastně tady byl a zůstal stále v kontaktu, uh, ať už jakoby tady z, z, jakoby z Bohumína nebo, z, z něku, nebo třeba z Prahy, když trénoval, jestli jsou lidi, kteří uh, jsou v kontaktu a, a stále se jakoby zajímají o Pavla. Jo, jo, tak Dan Zítka určitě. I would, I would mention Daniel Zítka, who is... Jo, to je bývalý trenér, who... jakoby ze Sparty. Who was a, a coach of uh, the goalkeepers in Sparta Prague? Uh, Milan Baroš uh, občas něco napíše. From time to time, I'm in contact with Milan Baroš, uh, who sends me some messages and always remember Pavel uh, at the at the date uh, he died. Uh, I'm And I'm in contact with uh, Tomáš Laštůvka, who's a goalkeeper of Banik Ostrava at the moment. And a couple of friends here in, uh, in Bohumín uh, who are still uh, in contact with me and uh, we re- uh, who remembers uh, Pavel uh, for all the time. Uh- Last question for Milan. What has he made of Martin Dubravka? Um, I remember Pavel mentioning that Martin Dubravka was going to be a good goalkeeper. Uh, he obviously moved to Newcastle like Pavel. He's done very well. Teď se ptá na Dubravku, což je v podstatě brankář Newcastle, který měl zhruba podobnou cestu do Newcastle jako Pavel, čili teď tam šel na nějaké testování a pak tam zůstal. Tak jak vnímáš jakoby jeho, jeho situaci, jak přestoupila a jak ho vidí dál? Myslím si, že Doubravka, že, že už byl s Pavlem ve styku, jakoby předtím. I think that uh, uh, Doubravka uh, was in contact uh, with Pavel uh, before, he, before he, he went to Newcastle. A že si myslím, že uh, chvilku uvažoval i, že by ho dostal do Sparty, ale... Uh, I think that uh, Pavel uh, tried to uh, get Dubravka to Sparta Prague, but uh, finally it, it never happened. Uh, uh, myslím, že dobře. And I think he, he is doing very well. Uh, he is a good goalkeeper and I wish, I wish him uh, everything what is good for his future. Great stuff. Dennis, um, we're going to finish off just asking each of you um, about your, me- your, you know, what, what is the main memory that you've got of Pab? What, you know, give, us, give us your last, your last comment on, on Pab. Well, uh, there's so many memories, but I, I suppose really the big thing that's, that's, that you think about when you think of Pab is what I've already said really is just his warmth and his genuineness and um, just the the type of person he was you know he he just epitomized what is what is you know a great human being you know the way he thought about things his his opinion of things he's he's 
his kindness, his, his, his caring, his dedication to whatever he did. He was just, he was just an all-round fantastic human being, you know. Uh, that's, that's the thing that, that sticks in my mind more than anything, you know. And, you know, when I'm with, as I mentioned earlier on, and Steve, how he knows, knows Tom very well, so he's probably heard this, I would think, from, from Tom as well, is, you know, when I'm with Tom and Lorenzo, and we meet quite regularly. In fact, we're meeting tomorrow, would you believe? We're going to Lorenzo's. Uh, he's cooking food. It's the first time we've met for three months and we're going to watch the Newcastle Villa game on BT Sport and Lorenzo's putting all the food on. I don't know whether you're coming along, Steve. Um, but um, if you ask those two guys, whenever we get together, they're the big things that the three of us often come out with, you know, if just how unique and, and how what a wonderful man he was, you know, and he's just such a miss because of that. Uh, he's a very, very difficult person to ever forget about. Steve, your same question to you, your final, your, your final comment on, on Pavel Cernicek as a man. And <clears throat> Well, I think it's, it's kind of been said uh, through, through this um, little show. And, um, but I mean, you know, part, we used to try and everybody used to take the mick out of each other. Um, you always knew how far you could push Pav because he'd obviously turn around and sort of say, hey, enough. And when Pav tells, tells you it's enough, it's enough. It's just the kind of a, it's not the brightest of, of, of people or person that takes it that little bit further. But I think I'd, I'd mentioned you to, uh, before about the, um, the one with Lee Clark when Lee Clark obviously wasn't happy that he'd been dropped by Kevin and uh, Kevin joined in the five-a-side and, and, and Nash, that's his nickname, he absolutely just done Kevin completely. But I don't think he was happy with that. And he wanted, he was just going around trying to kick people. Anyway, the biggest mistake he ever did was try to go in late on Pav. Well, Pav, as, it, as we've mentioned before, he's, he's just pure athleticism and his freakiness of, of his stretching and his kind of how elastic he was. Um, Pav didn't like the fact that Nash had come in a little bit late. And uh, Lee Clark was standing up and Pav just whipped his foot right over the top of his head. Um, and obviously, he, he knew exactly what he was doing. And I've never seen Lee Clark turn green so quick in all my life and basically back off as much in all my life. I mean, he absolutely, pardon my French, Nash absolutely shit himself, to be quite honest. But we <laughs> thought it was hilarious. But Pav just looked at him with his leg hovering over the top of his head and he just went, hey, no. And uh, I mean, we were killing ourselves laughing, but obviously Lee Clark, he just got to me. I mean, ask him, I know he does the thing with you on a Saturday and stuff like that, but ask him that story. He absolutely shit his pants when he did that. I will do. Um, Milan, final final message from, from you, please, for Newcastle supporters. <laughs> just for sure, have you, got a, have you got a message for the Newcastle fans? Ta se tě na tvoji poslední zprávu, kterou bys chtěl předat Newcastle jako takovou. No, tak uh, určitě bych sem chtěl, aby Newcastle se z 13. místa dostal na špici tabulky. Uh, my wish is to see Newcastle not on uh, the 13th position, but on the first position in uh, Premier League. Uh, aby jednou dosáhli titulu, anebo alespoň, aby se hrala Newcastle Liga mistrů. And I would like to see uh, sometimes... Uh, Uh, Champions Champions League uh, to be played in a Newcastle. That's my wish, and all the best for Newcastle. David, thank you very much for uh, helping translate. Please send um, our love and best wishes to the Czech family. Please thank Milan for, for joining in. Uh, absolutely, absolutely brilliant. And uh, Dennis, again, thanks for joining. Uh, You're the, welcome. Grasping the technology. Thank you. And Steve is always great to speak to him. And, uh, yeah. and, and hopefully helping us to raise some money for the money. If anybody does want to donate, if you've enjoyed this tonight, please like the interview, share the interview, and you can donate on Newcastle Legends. I will leave the link up to the company. Hopefully we can raise some money uh, for the fight against the But uh, thanks very much. Take care. Cheers, guys. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks for everything. Bye-bye. Right.